Jamaica's YouTube channel or One Spot Media. We're also live on Music 99 and GoJamaica.com. If you have any questions on today's subject, you can send them in to Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at Television Jamaica underscore Jamaica. Today's lesson is on CSEC physics. I am Prathon Dawkins. All right, so good morning again, students, for those who have tuned in. Today, we'll be looking at current electricity. Yeah, that scary thing that some, most persons are afraid of, they can't see, and they say that potentially can kill people. Well, yeah, we're going to figure out a bit more about what really goes on behind the scenes of current and electricity. Now, the question may be asked one or twice in your life, or even yourself may have asked the question, what is electricity? I tried to come up with something that you could probably understand. Well, let's just see what's up. Electricity is considered to be the movement or flow of charged carriers, which is a current, through a conducting material when an electric potential or voltage gives energy to the charged carriers. Quite a mouthful, but let's just break this down. First of all, you gotta have movement. Movement of what? Charge carriers, because that's what constitutes the current. Without the charge carriers moving, there is no current, and you can't get electricity. It must move through a conducting material, because as you see later on in the lesson, if the material is not able to conduct, then you can't have an electric current. And when it conducts, it must conduct by virtue of what we call an electric potential or voltage, you're probably more associated with that term, that gives energy to the charge carriers. Because really, electricity flowing is a conversion of energy process, whereas something provides the electrical energy, and then the charge carriers carry it to wherever it needs to go to, which is the load, and then it converts electrical energy to other forms, be it light or sound, or whatever the case may be. All right, now, with regards to what the charge carriers are, let's look a, look, look a bit further into it. Now, charge carriers, these are mobile particles that have an overall negative or positive charge that carries electrical energy through a conducting material. Layman terms, particles, either negative, positive, and they carry the energy from the source to wherever it needs to go to, which is the load. And it passes, of course, through the conducting material. Now, there are three categories of conducting material that I've identified for you here. First one, metals. And the charge carriers there are electrons, the negative charge. For semiconductors like the silicon and the, that type of thing, the, thing, the main material in term, um, inside of electronics, yeah, they're not exactly conductors and they're not exactly non-conductors. They're somewhere in the middle. And as a result, these charge carriers are not just the electrons, but they're also what we like to call holes. There's a diagram that explains this in a bit, so don't worry about it. For electrolytes, for the chemistry persons, you would have been familiar with this term. Electrolytes are basically conducting liquid uh, that when you pass a current through it, it actually allows current to flow through it. And by itself, it can actually generate a current, right? And it conducts by way of what we call ions. For chemistry persons, you know this term. Ions are basically charged particles. When you start out with atoms, you strip it of an electron, you add an electron, you get an ion. If you add an electron, it becomes overall negatively charged, and therefore it's called an anion. If you take an electron, it becomes overall positive charge and becomes a cation. So really and truly, that is how electrolytes will conduct an electrical current. Metals are electrons, semiconductors are carriers, um, the holes and electrons, electrolytes are the cations and anions. Now, here's a diagram that shows how charges typically or basically flow through a conducting material. Here we have the conductor enclosed in the rectangle here. We have what we call free electrons. We must have the free electrons because, as I said, for current to flow, you must have something moving and the charges must move. Outside of that conducting material, we have a voltage source identified here. Batteries are typical voltage sources, but they're not the only ones. The plus and the minus indicates the polarity or where the charges come from and where they go to. And rule of electricity, electrostatic interaction, is that negative repels negative, positive repels positive, but negative and positive attract. So what we have here is that the negative from this terminal enters into the material, it moves across the material, and then it comes back out to the positive side, 
And once we have that continuous flow of negative charge, then we have a current flowing through this material onto the semiconductor. Now, you won't be able to see this, but here at the top, it says electron conduction. And here, up here, also it says hole conduction. And then, of course, you have the battery that was shown before, and this is saying conventional current. We'll get to that in a bit. Don't worry yourself about that. But for now, all you need to know is that this semiconducting material does not have the free electrons as the metal would have. Instead, what it has is a little distribution of electrons and what you call holes. Now, a hole is really created when you form the semiconducting material and there is a deficit of electrons. If you go back to chemistry, you know that bonding is as a result of sharing of electrons, right? Well, we have a material here that does not have a full pair. There is a gap, and that gap is what forms the hole, quote unquote. So because of this hole being present, the electrons that are present are able to jump into the holes. And when it jumps into the hole, it itself creates a hole. So it's like this, a hole is over here, the electron jumps here and it creates a hole here. All right? So that is what is happening here. Electron jumps from one place to another, leaves a hole behind. It jumps to another one, leaves a hole behind. So what you have is that the electrons will migrate one way and the holes will migrate the opposite way. That is how essentially how semiconductors conduct. They don't have free charges moving as our metal would. Now, when it comes down to the electrolyte, what we have is a same pathway but instead of a physical metallic conduct, um, connection, or a solid connection rather, what we have is a liquid forming that um, interface for the charges to move. Now on one side, you see here that this bar is labeled as being positive. That now, well, if you go, if you delve into chemistry a bit, that would be called an electrode. And this also is an electrode, but this one, is where the cations will tend to migrate towards, all right? Well, no, the anions, rather, because the anions would have to give up the positive charge, and then it will flow it on the outside, and then the cations go to the negative wherever it is, and it will take it. So what happens is that the negative symbol here represents an anion. It goes towards what we call a cathode. It gives over this electron to the cathode, and then it forms, it carries the electron across on the outside to the anode, and then the, the, the cation goes there and collects that um, cation. All right, so that is pretty much what is happening there. Now, with regards to charge, current, and time, now all three are linked, and the link is shown here. But definition for charge, the charge is defined as the total number of carriers that pass a given point when electric current flows for a certain amount of time. So three things are required, well, two things are required for a current to flow. The charge must be present, which is basically the carriers, the positive, the negative, and it must flow for a certain amount of time. Now the relationship that relates all three are shown here. Normally my math teacher years ago told me that they call this the magic triangle. I don't know what they call it nowadays, but it's a very convenient, very useful triangle when you have two terms that multiply to give a third. If you don't know how this works, it's simple. The three are highlighted here. If you want to know how to find one of them, you just simply cover it. So when you cover Q, you're left with I and T. Because I and T are beside each other, they would multiply, all right? So Q really is I multiplied by T. What happens when you need I? Same thing, you cover I. Instead, you have Q over T. Once you have one over the other, that's divide. For T, it's Q over I. So come again, Q is I times T, I is Q over T, and T is Q over I. So if you don't want to have to recall these three equations verbatim, you can just put them in a triangle like this. And this applies to any two terms that multiply to give a third. And the equations are given there. Now I've highlighted on the board here, but I'll just read it for, for the persons who are looking here. I is a current, and that's measured in amperes. Note the spelling A-M-P-E-R-E. -E. Q is the symbol for charge. Don't ask me why, but that's what they have agreed upon. And the unit for charge is coulombs. Note the spelling C-O-U-L-O-M-B-S. And T is, of course, time, and that's the SI unit for time is, of course, seconds. Now, 
There's a question that is stated here. I'm going to read it out for you if you are not clear as to what the time on it is, uh, what the, the information says, rather. The makers of a popular cell phone have upgraded their battery capacity, which is the charge their store, from 4,320 coulombs to 9,000 coulombs. So that's an almost 100% jump. As a matter of fact, that looks a bit, no, it's almost a 100% jump. So if the, char the standard charger can deliver a current of 0 0.6 amperes, how much more time, more time will it take to charge the new battery than the old? So we have a situation where we have one charge, we can label that as Q1, which is 4350 coulombs. And then we have a second charge, the bigger charge of exactly 9,000 coulombs. And they say to us that the current that it can deliver from the charger is 0 0.6 amperes. And they ask us now, how much more time would we need to charge the, the second one, the new one, versus the old one? So we need to find time one and time two. All right? So let's just backtrack a bit to the equation. If we look at the equation, we realize that to find the time, we need charge and current. Do we have charge? Yes, we have the two charge values and we have the current values. So we can just remove these question marks and say, okay, time one must be Q1 over the current, which is 4,350 coulombs over 0 0.6 amperes. All right, you can work that out. Afterwards, we get back to what the answer is there. And for the second one, you would say that this is Q2 over I, which is 9,000 over 0 0.6 amperes. All right? So when you work that one out, you would know what the value of the, uh, the time is in seconds. And then based off that value of time in seconds, you would just simply subtract time 2 from time 1 to find what the change in time is. So this would be able to tell you how much more time it would take because this is a time, this is a greater time, because this is a larger number. So when this works out, you get a larger number here. So T2, you take T1 from T2, that gives you what the time difference is and that will tell you how much more greater the time would be required for the battery to be charged being at 9,000 coulombs versus 4320, was it? Or 4320? At 4350, so it's 4320 over the 0 0.6 amperes, and that will tell you what the time value would be. All right. Now, in terms of the second part, the question reads, in order to maintain a competitive edge, meaning that the manufacturer of the cell phone, the cell phone maker needs to keep the same charging time for the new model the same as the old model. Because, you know, nowadays technology should be quicker for you. It should be more convenient. So they don't want a greater time that is shown here. They want it to be the same. So if they want it to be the same, something must change. Can't change the charge because that's what they built. So if they want for you to have a lesser time, what do we need to change? If you said the current, you'd be correct. But we don't know what the current value is. We need to find out because they ask the question, what must be the current rating on a new charger to accomplish this? So, based on the equation that was given, Q over IT, let me just backtrack to the equation. We see here that I is equal to Q over T. So, with regards to that current, what are they asking? Current rating, exactly. So for the same time, we must find what the current rating is. So with regards to that, we'd have to take time two because really and truly, no, it'd have to be time one, right? Because you need to know what this time is because this being a greater time, Therefore, this will take longer to charge that same cap um, the capacity that is available here. So with time one being a smaller value, you need to put the greater charge over the smaller time to find out what current value that is. And that when that works out, that will give you the value in amperes. So in essence, to work these two questions out, you would state the, the, the two charge values, state the current that's available, find the times, 
you subtract the two to find how much greater time is required. In terms of maintaining the competitive edge, you need a greater current. So therefore, the bigger charge for the same time, what current would be required to cause this to charge at the same time value? Basically like designing a fast charging charger. All right, bigger charge, but they need for it to charge the same time, so they need to know what current is. Now, on to a little paradox here. Paradox, and you'll understand what I mean. Conventional current versus electron flow. Electric current flow is assumed by convection, convention rather, or the accepted norm to flow from the positive to the negative terminal of a voltage source. When you look at a battery, a battery has two ends, plus and a minus. So when it regards to current, current will flow from one end to the other. But the question is asked, which end would it flow from? Will it flow from the positive to the negative, or would it flow from the negative to the positive? The answer is really, they accept both. Yeah, it's kind of counterintuitive, but I'll explain why. This is corresponding to the electrical energy drop from a high potential to a low potential, meaning that whenever energy is accumulated, it must come from a high energy dense region, from a high potential. Let's think of going up a hill. When you're at a hill, top of a hill, things naturally roll down because they have energy to roll down. So they're at a high potential, base of the hill, low potential. So therefore, when they're comparing energy in terms of electrical, they use the same terminology. So really and truly, a current must flow from a high potential to a low potential, and they assume that they assign the high potential to be positive. So that is where the convention comes from. High to low potential, plus to minus. Similar to when water flows down a slope and loses potential energy. So this is the diagram now to show conventional current flow. This symbol is a battery, plus is a high potential, positive terminal, current flows in a loop, to the minus or the low potential point. That's convention. Now, here's where the confusion comes in a bit. In reality, only electrons, negative charges, are actually free to move within a metal conductor. Hmm, what's going on here? Hence, when a current flows, it is because of the movement of free electrons, which would migrate from the negative to the positive terminal of a voltage source. So that is where the dilemma falls in now. You cannot tell me that there are positive charges moving in a um, metallic conductor because the positive charges are fixed in place. The only thing that can move are electrons. And electrons will naturally move from where there are many, which is a negative, to where there are few, which is a positive. So therefore, it should flow from the negative to the positive. But hold on. Before, when we're talking about conventional current, they said that current flows from the positive to the negative, And they accepted that as well. So here we have a situation where from reasoning and from philosophy, they say that current flows from positive to negative. So convention is from positive to negative, so that's how it should flow. But yet, from logic, we have electrons flowing from negative to positive. Don't get into the debate. Just accept the both, all right? But what I can tell you right now is that the more accepted, the more used convention is the positive to negative. So when you're dealing with current flow, just know that it is always going to be assumed positive to negative. And here we have a diagram showing um, electron flow. Negative terminal, round the loop to the positive terminal. Electric charges move from the negative surplus, where the surplus of electrons are, to where they are deficient or the positive side. All right, and here's a comparison. So what they're saying is that the electron, the current conventionally flows from plus to minus, which is this way, clockwise, and the electrons will migrate in the wire physically from negative to positive. Both are accepted, but the convention is more used than the electron flow itself. All right, so when it comes on to what is a conductor, what is an insulator, your guess is as good as any as to what they consider to be conductor or insulator. Real and truly, given the right conditions, materials that are termed are think, thought to be non-conducting, will be able to conduct, but we're talking about normal circumstances here. So there is a distinction between materials that allow current to flow and those that do not allow current to flow. And here we have conductor and insulator. Generally speaking, and you would have already guessed it, it makes sense, it's logical. Materials that are metallic in nature, good. Those are conductors, because remember, for current to flow, we must have what? Free charges, 
and the charges are only found, well, mostly found in metallic uh, materials. So copper, aluminum, steel, any metal for, for, for that argument's sake would be considered to be a conductor. Any material that allows electric current to pass through it, conductor. Now, the opposite of a conductor, which I said was a non-conductor earlier on, is an insulator. So when you hear about insulation, insulator, it is preventing the flow of something. And in this case, it's the flow of an electric current. Any material that does not allow electric current to pass through it, like the protective coating on wires, wires are wrapped with um, insulator, those are insulators. Plastic, rubber, glass, wood, cloth, anything that does not have the free electrons for the current to flow is considered to be an insulator. And it compares this simple experiment. Is it a conductor or an insulator? So we have a battery. We have a device that shows that current is present. We have the material that is either the conductor or insulator. And we have connecting wires from the plus terminal around to the minus. When you put a paper clip in it, metal, it conducts, bulb lights. Hey, steel is a conductor. When we put a rubber duck in it, it says plastic, then we realize that the bulb doesn't light. It's not because we're discriminating against, it. Um, we're not discriminating against the duck, no. It's just a situation that the duck is made of plastic, and because of that, it won't light the bulb, because it's not a conductor. All right, now, let us look at voltage. What is this thing called voltage? It's essentially the driving force of electricity. What is voltage? It's defined as an influence, an influence that is able to impart electrical energy to charge carriers as they move through the power source from low potential to a high potential. In a sense, what you want is something that forces charges to move. And by forcing them, it gives them energy. So once you're able to achieve this, then you have a voltage source. All right, and it flows from one terminal to the other. Now, the analogy between voltage and water flow, I always like to use this, my students will tell you. Just imagine the battery being a water pump, the wires being the connecting pipes for the water supply. The bulb is like a water wheel that provides resistance or anything that spins as a result of water flow, be it a turbine or whatever. And of course, the current is the water flow itself. So the battery is the pump, wires are the pipes, the bulb being the load is like water wheel or turbine. The wires are like the pipes that connect from one end of the pump to the other. So essentially, the battery would be what forces the water to flow. So, well, the pump would be what forces the water to flow. So the battery would, is what forces the current to flow. So if you want to envision what voltage is truly about, let's remember this analogy. Pump, battery, pipes, wires. Bulb, um, the turbine or water wheel. Current is the water. All right? Good. Now, the equation for voltage. Uh, the symbols given here, V, W, and Q, they're stated here, but we use here. V is the potential difference in volts. W is the work done. It can also be energy transferred in joules. And Q is the charge in coulombs. All right? And the equation is given there. Remember that triangle? Yeah. Two things that multiply to give a third, it reappears there. Now, quick question. Here we have a battery generates a voltage of 3.5 volts while flowing a charge of 2.75 coulombs. What is the work done on the battery? Now, remember the equation? So we have, let's just write those down. We have a 3.5 volts for a voltage, and we have a 2.75 coulombs for a charge, and we're asked to find out about the work that is done. Based on the equation that's there, we have work being equal to, when you cover it, it will tell you, right, voltage times charge, which is, of course, the 3.5 volts, times the 2.75, and that's volts, and that's coulomb. And then that value now will give you what your energy is, and that will be measured in joules. All right, I don't want to guess on live television. Calculator is not with me, so your guess, is, your guess would be based on what your calculator tells you, so you can work that out. But essentially, that's how that's worked out. All right, now, in terms of the accumulator, 
question here. Quick question again. A 20 volt accumulator, so we know that the voltage is 20 volts. It converts 30 watts, so that's power. And 30 joules of power, energy rather. So that's energy. That should have been joules through a bulb while pushing a current through a resistor during a one minute duration. All right, so we don't know what the current is, and we know that the time is one minute, and that's equal to 60 seconds. All right. All right. So a little genie told me that number. So that's your number there. So in terms of the question here, how much total charge of the battery flow through the circuit? All right, remember the equation that deals with charge? Uh, work is equal to, rather voltage is equal to work over charge, which is big Q. So charge is actually work over voltage, and that would be the 30 joules over the 20 joules. This I can tell you is 1.5 coulombs, right? And then based off what is given here, we already found that. Since we know the time and we're given the charge, we can find the current because I is equal to Q over T. On the previous question that worked, so that's 1.5 coulombs over 60 seconds, and that will give you a certain current value in terms of what the time is, the current rather. Now electrical power is, um, is similar to the power that um, a motor will be able to generate, you generate, and that's the equation for electrical power. Power in circuits is converted from light to other forms, electrical to other forms rather, Electrical energy is transferred by electrical current. That is the equation. Now, we're going to work through real quickly how we get that equation for power. You have to recall that Q is equal to I T, and you also have to recall that V is equal to W over Q. All right? Now, when we substitute Q is equal to V, W over V. Uh, let me just do it the other way. W is equal to V times Q. And that's equal to now, when we put this in it, V, I times T. So that's what we get. And then when we bring over T, we get V is equal to I. Now recall that this, Work over time is actually power. So power is equal to IV. It's a simple derivation that you should be aware of. So Q is equal to IT, V is equal to W over Q. When you work everything out, the mathematicians can tell you that you'd get P is equal to IV. All right, there's a question there that we can look at. Uh, so in terms of that question here, I want to do one of these questions. An electric motor develops a power output of 1.2 kilowatts. So that's 1.2 kilowatts. Remember, when you convert kilo, you get 1,200 watts. And then that's a 220 means AC. So they ask now, what current? Remember, P is equal to IV. So I is really P over V, which is that 1,200 divided by the uh, 220. And that would work out to be roughly something there. I just have to leave it there. All right. So in, in terms of the working out of the current, it's a simple thing. Once you know the equation, you just plug the values in, and then you shouldn't have a problem there. All right? So we're going to take a break. Schools and I will be right back. Stay with us.
risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with a cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. COVID-19 tip. Protect yourself and others from getting sick by washing your hands after coughing or sneezing when caring for the sick, before, during, and after you prepare food, before eating, after toilet use, when hands are visibly dirty, and after handling animals or animal waste. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, along with TVJ, present Schools Not Out, CSEC and Cape Lessons, live Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, with weekly Schools Not Out tutorial sessions on Saturdays from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Schools Not Out, live CSEC and Cape Lessons, here on TVJ. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with a cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. COVID-19 tip. Protect yourself and others from getting sick by washing your hands after coughing or sneezing when caring for the sick before, during, and after. Welcome to Schools Not Out, where we are discussing CSEC physics. All right, so before we left, we were working this question out, and I found the value. So pretty much, when you look at this question, the winch operates, no, no, the electric motor develops a power output of 1.2 kilowatts, that's 1,200 watts, while operating on a 220 AC volt supply, or means. How much current does the motor pull? So, as I said, the equation is P is equal to IV, and when we transpose for I, we have P over V, that's 1,200 over two, um, 220, and that gives us 5.45 amperes of current. For the previous question that we are working on, the current was found to be 0 0.025 amperes in terms of what the current uh, that the motor was able to pull. Now, for the second question, I'm going to work that out real quick. We see a similar situation, but it's a bit modified. A winch, which um, is a cable um, pulling uh, load thing that you'd see on, like, what's it called? The record trucks, right? The winch op operates at 110 volts. And then it pulls a maximum current, I, of 15 amperes. All right? The motor runs for two minutes. Now, two minutes, remember, time should be in seconds. All right. Uh, so we have to convert that, and that gives us 120 seconds. So it asks the question, determine, determine the power rating of the winch. So P is equal to IV. That's the first part. We know I, we know V, so that's 110 volts times 15 amperes, and that gives us 1650 watts. And if you'd like, you can convert that to kilowatts. That's divided by 1,000. That gives you 1.65 kilowatts. All right, these things pull large currents, so they're really powerful. All right. Now, in terms of the how much energy, electrical energy converts to mechanical during this operation, we need to note that this, now we just worked out its power. Now, if you can recall from mechanics, power is equal to energy over time. 
So don't confuse yourself. This and that are the same equations but for different quantities. This is for electrical power. This is for mechanical power. Because remember, the winch operates by converting electrical energy to mechanical. So we need to know what time it takes. So as we're dealing with mechanical energy, uh, so we need to convert this equation to time. Converting to time gives us energy over power. All right, and that would be the value of 16. Let me just write out the exact value divided by the 120 seconds. And that gives us 13.75 uh, seconds. What is it? No. What are we doing here? Right. Energy. No, no, no. I got it confused here. No, no, no. Let me start over. We're doing time. How much electrical energy? Okay. I did the wrong transposition. So we're finding E. All right. So E is actually power times time. So that is 1650, and that's multiplied by the 120, all right? And then that would give us what we need in joules, all right? So it's really the energy that we need to find and not the time, because the time we know already. Good. So when you work that out, that will give us the energy in joules of what is converted. Now, for our last section, circuit symbols. When it comes on to circuit symbols, when it deals with circuit symbols, they are images or diagram representations of how electrical components within a theoretical or actual circuit are connected to function as desired. So in layman terms, when you're dealing with circuit symbols, you're dealing with drawings of actual things. So if you want to represent how your house is wired, they give you a wiring diagram, which is in essence what we're talking about here. And the wiring diagram re um, relies on actual symbols that is universally um, interpreted and they are connected to just show the actual way in which the circuit is operating. All right? Now, each electrical component has its own symbol and all components within a circuit are shown in the diagram as being connected as they are in the physical circuit. Meaning, each component of the circuit itself has a special and specific diagram that is used worldwide. So anybody who knows how to interpret circuit diagrams, once they see a certain symbol that everybody agrees upon, then they would say that, all right, this is the symbol that we're talking about. So for example, when you look at this diagram, this is an actual switch, flip up switch, flip down for, 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 for complete, flip up for breaking. That's a bulb on the left, that's a battery, and the wire connects the battery to the bulb to the switch and comes back around. So instead of the switch, you got this symbol. For the bulb, you have this symbol. For the battery, you have that symbol. And the wire is just simply a line. So the actual circuit is this. The schematic or the circuit diagram is shown as that. All right? Now here are some list of typical circuit symbols. Switch is given here. This is an open position, that's in the closed position. The cell or battery is given like that, plus for the longer part, um, and then the minus should be there, but it didn't show it. That's a cell. When you have many cells connected together, we have a battery, uh, an accumulator sometimes they call it. This is a diode for electronics and for rectification and all of that. When you go into electronics, you learn more about the diode, but that's a symbol. Resistor is drawn as a rectangle with two ends sticking out. A variable resistor or resistance that can change its value is similar to the resistor, but you have an arrow pointing like that. LED, bulbs that uh, illuminate um, certain lighting devices. You know, normally today's bulbs are LED. That's the symbol that they use. The lamp is given as that. The fuse is given as that. Voltmeter, ammeter, thermistor, which is basically a thermal resistor and LDR. These are not so typical at the CSEC level, but you still need to be aware of them. But the more typical ones are given as such. So when you're dealing with, dealing with circuit symbols, these are the accepted symbols that they're using to represent what is actually uh, the arrangement for components within a circuit. All right? Now in terms of the actual circuit, here we have a series circuit. 
and we'll delve a bit more into that in our next class. But series circuit, as the name suggests, next one follows the other in series. So what we have is a battery, a plus and minus terminal, that's connected towards this, a switch, and this is in an open position. And they say that the current flows through the wire. And then we have one, two, three bulbs, and they are the loads on the circuit. Because anything that converts electrical energy into other forms is considered to be a load. All right? And they follow one behind the other. They are connected in line, hence the term series circuit. All right? Now, in terms of the actual diagram for this, I'm going to really sketch it out for you so you have an idea as to how this is done. So typically, I start with my battery. All right? And you can represent it by any number of cells given there. All right? It depends on the voltage. Then I put in what the plus and minus is. What follows next, because if it's from the plus, I have to respect the orientation. So if it's from the plus side, we draw the switch in the open position. And then for the circuit symbols that are used, because there are other symbols for lamps, so we're going to use the one that is given there. So they say that they have one lamp, they have two lamps, they have three lamps, and I believe that would be it. Right. And then we simply would connect it. And don't worry about my turning the corner here. You can turn the corner whichever way you want, just as long as you're not creating a junction. And that, in a sense, is the circuit symbol for that actual thing. All right? You represent your battery. You can label them if you want. Battery. This is your switch. These are your bulbs. And if you want, you can put in the wire. All right, that captures, in a sense, what you really have um, working here. Actual parallel circuit. So here we have a battery, another switch, and then we have bulbs, but they're not connected in line as they were before. No, what they're connected in, in a fashion is what we like to call a junction fashion. There's a point where the current now can go in more than one direction. All right? So if we were to draw something like this, we draw the battery again, and then we would draw the junction point, and also what, a bulb, and then it splits here again at the junction. All right, and I believe, oh yeah, and there's a switch that should be represented there, and it's connected there. So here's the thing. The battery is positive terminal or it feeds directly to the bulb. And then, yeah, the terminal, the switch is actually on the negative part. So it's down here. All right. So we have the battery that follows to the bulb. And then here is what creates this junction. So it can go through this as it is going through here. Or it can go through this as it goes through here. So this point here is the junction point. And of course, the junction forms back here. All right, so that is how you draw that type of thing. All right, and they give other circuit arrangements here. All right, to talk quickly about the voltmeter and the ammeter. Voltmeters are measured voltage and are connected across loads. Ammeters measure current and are connected in line with current through loads. So when we look at the diagram here, you have a situation where the ammeter is connected in line with the circuit. The voltmeter is connected across the load itself. That is how you connect ammeter and voltmeter. It should not be a situation where the voltmeter and the ammeter are connected as such. Because what we have here is a situation that the meters seem to be in the right place, but the symbols are wrong. When you look at this one, this is in line with the load. This is across the load. So this is good. The battery is there. But for this, symbols are reversed. So the voltmeter ends up here, the ammeter ends up here. We cannot have that arrangement. Voltmeter cannot be in line. Ammeter cannot be connected across. We cannot have that situation where, yeah, this is connected in that fashion. All right? So that's all for today for CSEC Physics. We hope you grasp some of the points that we have put on here.
discussed. You can catch a repeat of today's lesson on JNN Today at 5 p.m. and in Schools Not Hot Highlights on Saturday between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. right here on TVJ. It will also be on video on demand on One Spot Media. Until next time, I'm Pethorn Dawkins. Stay with us. CSEC English A is up next.